Good evening, curse loving people of the internet. Welcome to the scary corner, where while we love, you know, all things weird and unexplainable, the goal is never to actually like genuinely scare or curse anyone. I promise. My name is Alexa, and I'm the resident ooky spooky girly around here. If you're a fan of the channel, then you know that we love, 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 love Ed and Lorraine Warren and their incredible museum around here. Sadly, it's been closed for a while due to uh, zoning law confusion, but you can bet the next time it's open, I'll be on the first flight over. It's full of various artifacts, books, and items you wouldn't believe. But today, I'm here to talk about the top five cursed artwork in the Warren Occult Museum. In fifth place, we have Ed's paintings. So long before they were famed ghost hunters investigating you know, the Amityville horror and featured in films such as The Conjuring, Ed and Lorraine had a much different hobby painting. Actually, it was how the duo made a living. Ed Warren was a trained fine arts painter. The duo traveled all over the country to sell their paintings and they also taught art classes. The couple used Ed's paintings as a way to gain entry into houses they wanted to investigate. They would research houses they believed to be haunted and then drive to the house. After Ed painted the house in question, he would then hand the painting to Lorraine, who would go up, knock on the door, and offer the homeowners a painting, which would usually turn into a conversation about the property and the hauntings. This process was how their investigative career began. Ed became known for his barn door art, painting tranquil winter scenes on stained pine, which was all the range for adorning the wood grain halls of any home in the late 60s, and apparently these paintings are now quite rare. Many of his paintings that have been photographed feature different haunted houses, and examples of his art and calligraphy style are displayed throughout the museum. In fourth place, we have black magic masks. These fall under the practice of tulpa, which is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal of a materialized thought form, typically in human form, such as an imaginary friend or being that is created through spiritual practice and intense concentration. In simpler English, the masks act as a representation of the practice, which is a form of mysticism that involves creating sentient and autonomous beings separate from oneself. So. An imaginary friend? The concept of tulpas and their creation, including the word tulpa, come from a closed Tibetan Buddhist practice, with tulpa being a Tibetan word for creature of the mind. Tulpas did not become part of Western paranormal lore until the 1970s, and those who practice have been cited as wearing masks similar to Halloween ones in order to take on the appearance of whatever the mask looks like. I guess that explains why I've seen many cheap looking Halloween masks in the video walkthroughs from the museum, so I suppose I'll retract my statements that I made about how pathetic they look. If anyone is curious about modern practices and appropriations of tulpa mancers, the interweb origins can be traced back to 4chan message boards in 2009, and no, if you don't know what that means, I'm not going to elaborate on just how cursed that sentence was to utter. Oh, it gets worse. All right. The communities gained popularity when adult fans of My Little Pony started discussing tulpas of characters from the Friendship is Magic television series. The fans attempted to use meditation and lucid dreaming techniques to create imaginary friends. Look, I knew someone back in high school who fell under that subculture, and he was the furthest thing from mentally stable. The guy had to... Uh, people munching fantasies as well. Uh, time to move on before I get nightmares again. In third place, we have a satanic idol. So this story began in 1991 when a deer hunter was walking through the woods in Connecticut close to where Ed and Lorraine resided. The hunter got lost and after some time stumbled upon a raised circular rock formation with the idol in question standing in the middle of it. It is believed that the formation was common with folks who practiced devil worship in the 70s. The hunter began to feel uncomfortable and left the area, deciding to make his way back to his car and along the way he noticed an elderly gentleman walking alongside him who was dressed head to toe in black. Now the man in black never spoke a single word to the deer hunter. The hunter was getting more nervous by the second and also more lost and unsure of his direction path. Desperate, he turned to the mysterious figure and simply asked, how do I get out of here? Luckily for our narrator, the man in black pointed in a direction and then disappeared. The hunter was so thrown off by that day that he reached out to Ed, who requested to be brought to the same area. The hunter wasn't 100% sure he could find the exact location, but was willing to try. Together, the men were able to stumble through the forest, and without the aid of the man in black this time, found the rock formation. Ed removed the demonic idol from the area and placed it at home in his museum, and that's when things got a little weirder. Because, you know, a man in black spotting and weird forest stuff isn't weird enough for us. Approximately three days after removing the idol, Lorraine collapsed for no known reason, and she was transported to the hospital where no one could identify what was wrong with her. Thankfully, after three more days, she recovered. Uh, red flag time! Threes and sixes are very popular numbers amongst the demonic scary people and things that you want to avoid. Ed believed that this was caused by the gentleman in black, who was believed to have been a high priest in a satanic cult as a form of payback for removing the satanic idol. Now, this idol remains in the Warrens Museum to this day, and honestly, 
I think it looks like a paper mache masterpiece of an alien, but please let me know in the comments if anyone out there has a different opinion. Mm. In second place, we have a shadow doll. So among one of the first haunted items visible in the museum to visitors is a shadow doll, which boasts bird feathers and a genuine human tooth. Mm -mm. Unlike the other dolls included in the museum, I'd consider this creature more of a sculpture, Ergo, why she made her way to my list today. Also, she's just overall terrifying to look at. I'm calling it now. She better join the TV universe soon. So a shadow doll is a statue or deity of sorts that is made specifically for harm and to be used at the center of curses. I happen to know the steps for the most common curse, and while I'll leave out a step for safety, yes, I promise I'll elaborate. So the caster would first need to take a picture of the doll, write a curse on the back of the photo, and then send it to whomever the curse is aimed for. The person who receives the picture with the curse will sadly invite that curse into their lives. I'm thinking, oh, totally forgot. The doll will also appear in that person's dreams. While not too much is known about the origins of this specific doll, it was initially purchased in a vintage store under the assumption that it was, you know, simply an antique. I have a couple of antique dolls myself, and I'm shuddering to think about what they would do if activated by any kind of curse. They've already got enough of a personality. Thanks. In our first place, we have a copy of Crying Boy. So when Bob Smith was a young child in the 70s, he became fascinated by a painting in his grandmother's house. The painting was a cheap print of a well-known piece and was hung on the living room wall. The photo depicted a boy who was a similar age to Bob and for some reason looked sad and downcast with tears brimming from his troubled eyes. A few years after the painting went up on the wall, there was a devastating kitchen fire in the house. While the kitchen was destroyed, the rest of the house was undamaged. The painting was eventually sold in a garage sale to Ed Warren himself. For years it puzzled Bob why his grandmother got rid of the painting until he read a series of articles about a cursed painting. Yep, that painting was The Crying Boy. That's the title of the painting. The Crying Boy was one in a series of paintings by artist Giovanni Bregolin that was completed in the 1950s. The series depicted young, teary-eyed younglings. While it may seem strange to want an image of a weeping child on your wall, the pictures proved popular all over the world. For example, in the UK alone, over 50,000 copies were sold. The children represented were often poor and very beautiful. In total, Giovanni painted over 60 paintings, and up until the early 80s, prints and reprints of his images continued to be mass produced. In 1985, the most popular tabloid newspaper in the United Kingdom printed a story that caused panic and ended the popularity of his work. The Sun published an article entitled Blazing Curse of the Crying Boy, describing the terrible experience of May and Ron Hall after their home was destroyed by fire. The cause of the fire, much like Bob's grandmother's, was a greasy pan that overheated and burst into flames. The fire spread rapidly and destroyed everything on the ground floor of the home. Only one item remained intact, print of the crying boy on their living room wall. Distraught at their loss, the devastated couple made the bizarre claim that the painting was cursed and it, not the pan, was the cause of the fire. Now, this tale probably would have disappeared into the archives of strange and mysterious stories, except for one, um, tiny thing. A firefighter claimed that he had attended at least 15 house fires where everything was destroyed except for Prince of the Crying Boy, which would remain completely intact. So before long, this gathered momentum, and a rash of fires all over the world were blamed on the cursed child, not to be confused with the play that's currently running of the same name. In subsequent articles, the Sun went on to claim that a woman had lost her house to a fire six months after buying the painting, two sisters had fires in their homes after buying a copy of the painting, when one sister even claimed to have seen her painting sway backwards and forwards on the wall while it was happening, a concerned woman on the Isle of Wight attempted to burn her painting without success and then went on to suffer a run of very bad luck, a gentleman in Nottingham who possessed a print of the painting lost his home and his family was injured, a pizza parlor got destroyed, including every painting on their walls except for the crying boy. When the Sun reported that even rational firefighters refused to have a copy of this painting in their homes, the reputation of the crying boy was damned forever. In all these cases, and many more that were reported, paintings of the crying boy went unharmed. Eventually, there was an image of a crying child by any artist in a house that went on fire. Now, some folks claimed that they experienced bad luck if they attempted to destroy or even get rid of the paintings, while others were convinced that it was only a matter of time before disaster struck them. The Sun eventually offered the frightened public a solution. On Halloween night of 1985, hundreds of the paintings were collected together by the newspaper and burnt under the supervision of the fire brigade. So why would this seemingly innocent series of paintings be cursed? Theories ranged from the little boy being from a Romani family who placed a curse on the artist, to others claiming that the subject of the painting had died in a fire and his spirit was trapped in the art. The most enduring story claimed that the boy accidentally set fire to the studio of Giovanni Bregolin. Simply put, wherever the little orphan went, fires mysteriously followed earning him the name Diablo or Devil. 
And that brings us to the end of our time for today. Seriously, can the museum reopen already? There's so many little artifacts that I've seen in video walkthroughs that I can't find anything about online that I am desperate to hear the stories about. While Anna and Lorraine are sadly no longer with us, their son-in-law Tony has taken over as the resident expert and I would love to pick his brain. Feel free to let me know in the comments what artifact you'd love to know more about. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more cursed content from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos.